Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today I wanted to talk about a very interesting study I recently discovered that tries to answer two questions. First, it tries to redefine the Kardashev scale, the scale of extraterrestrial intelligence, and also it tries to answer the so-called Fermi paradox, and it does a pretty good job at doing both. So let's talk about this and welcome to What the Math. So the biggest question, one of the biggest questions at least, is of course, where is everyone? Where are all the aliens? This is the sort of natural of the so-called Fermi paradox. There are so many different stars, so many different planetary systems, there are so many different potentials for extraterrestrial intelligence to exist, and we sort of think that it should be everywhere. But we haven't found anything and we have not heard anything. Every possible detection of aliens so far, specifically, Previous detections, like radio signals and other signals that we couldn't explain, have all been sort of naturally explained today. So for example, some of the first unexplained signals from objects that were really really bright and also from objects that were very periodical were either quasars or pulsars. And more recently, a lot of other unexplained signals turn out to be so-called fast radio bursts, which have also been more recently explained. So the mystery is sort of there, we haven't really found anything, but we expect aliens to be everywhere. At least mathematically speaking. And theoretically, we also even define aliens in different scales. The so-called Kardashev scale is the best such example, although there are other scales that also do a similar job to this. In this scale, there are three major types of civilizations. Type 1 civilization, also known as the planetary civilization, is able to use the entire energy of the planet. According to this definition, humans are slowly getting there. We're not there yet, but we're about to be there. Type 2 civilization would be a solar system or a star system civilization that's capable of using the entire energy of the solar system and also create these huge mega projects, such as for example the famous Dyson sphere that surrounds the typical star and collects as much energy from it as possible. You might already know the story of the so-called Tabby star, also known as KIC 84628528. This particular star was exhibiting unusual dimming patterns and one of the more more dramatic explanations of this was that maybe an alien civilization built a Dyson sphere around it and we were just observing the patterns of the Dyson rings passing in front of the star. But since then we were also able to explain all of this naturally. So these so-called type 2 civilizations should not really be that difficult to see because of all of these mega projects they would be uh, sort of creating around the galaxy. And lastly there is the type 3 civilization the galactic civilization that's able to control the entire galaxy and essentially produce projects that are even bigger than the Dyson Sphere itself. So for example, maybe these would be projects around ultra-massive and supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, or maybe these would be projects that would actually cover the entire galaxy as well. Interestingly, one of the more unusual explanations for these so-called galactic voids or these really unusual empty spaces in between galaxies were in regards to these galactic civilizations creating these huge projects, galaxy-wide projects, that would basically make the entire galaxy invisible. Now, that since then has been disproven mostly because the voids are actually formed by the galactic streams, and we've seen quite a lot of galactic streams and observed them using various telescopes, so it's not really a necessary explanation anymore. In other words, these voids form naturally. But nevertheless, it's a pretty interesting concept, and I guess some scientists were pretty excited to think about it that way when we discovered that there were these really large voids in the middle of the universe. In more mathematic terms, these civilization types can also be defined by the amount of energy they can actually produce using, for example, a planet, a star, or a galaxy. And in case of humans, we're not really there yet, but we're getting there. But here's the thing. The Kardashev scale, along with very similar other scales that have been produced over the past few decades, can all be defined as quantity-based scales. They're based on the idea that as we advance, we start making more, bigger, stronger, and more energy demanding machines, tools, and so on. So the idea here is that what we're observing today, the advances in technology, will be continuing and so our actual energy needs will increase as well. The major implication being that we go from having spacecrafts, for example, to having more and more complex space stations, to having actual colonies on planets, 
And eventually this starts encompassing the entire planet, then the entire solar system, and then the entire galaxy. It's somewhat interesting, but it is somewhat primitive, based on an assumption that as we evolve and become more advanced, our tools grow with us and become more advanced as well. So in other words, it's basically all based on quantity and tools and the actual power uh, that they consume. With the major concept here being manipulation by humans and the tools that we use. But these scales ignore one major dimension, the dimension of quality. Quality meaning that you don't really need to have more bigger and stronger things to evolve. You also need to have better things. And not just better things, you also have to become better yourself. The idea here is that as we actually learn to create better and bigger tools, we also start learning on how to become better ourselves and how to assimilate ourselves better with our surroundings. This is the so-called qualitative approach. The approach proposed by the scientists behind this paper. And in short, it can be defined as our need to improve ourselves in order to integrate better with the universe around us. Because that's what they believe is important for a more advanced civilization. And here we don't just focus on building bigger, better and stronger tools. We also start doing this to ourselves as well. We start modifying ourselves to fit with our new environment and to become better at adapting to new environments as well. But this is just the beginning and this is just the start of the so-called transformation for a more advanced alien species to become one with the environment. For example, in the last 10 years or so, we've advanced the so-called CRISPR genetic modification to the point where we can now easily modify any gene in any organism. And all of this came as a result of studying the genetic materials inside ancient bacteria and realizing that they were using these genetic modifications by themselves as well. So now we're actually learning something from these bacteria and trying to apply them to life around us. The other assumption here comes from the idea that as humans, we're far from being perfect in our own environment. So for example, the fact that we all need clothes and different types of clothes depending on the environment is already enough to show us that we are not really evolved to survive in certain environments. In most cases, we depend way too much on various tools for us to survive in various environments. And if we were to move to other planets and try to survive there, or even moons like for example Titan, we would need to have even more advanced tools and even more advanced protection in order for us to just survive on those objects, not even thrive, not even become more efficient. Not to mention that even our brain has evolved to the point where it's inefficient in the current modern environment. We're unable to function in these really large groups of people that we have around us today, and we're also are very limited by the computations and the calculations that our brains can do based on all of the information provided by the environment. So taking all of these and some other facts into consideration, the scientists behind the study decided to propose a slightly different or technically much different classification of different alien intelligences and the levels of alien advancement, which at the same time manages to answer the most important question, the Fermi paradox. And here we have four different classes. Class zero are animals. They use the environment as is and they don't try to modify anything. Class 1 are humans. We modify the environment, we can make clothes, we can create buildings, we can create all sorts of tools. But other than the use of tools and the modification of the environment, we do not really modify ourselves almost at all. And then we have class 2, which is when we start modifying the genes or other biological concepts in order for us to try to fit better into the environment. In a sense, we're sort of getting there. And at least in the last 10 years or so, we've already kind of slowly started to learn how to modify life around us and of course ourselves as well. Although currently most of the laws around the world prohibit us from directly modifying human genome. So we still have a lot to go and a lot to learn about before we can start modifying our own genes. And lastly, there is the class 3 civilization. And this is when we entirely merge with the environment around us creating the conditions where we can actually start turning that matter into living, functioning and thinking matter. Or the complete and total merging with the environment around us, allowing us to, well, utilize everything as efficiently as possible. And these four classes describe what we might be going through and why we don't actually see any aliens out there really well. So first of all, this totally removes the need for this assumption that we need to start building and keep building bigger and bigger tools. That we need to have these large objects that encompass the entire planet, encompass the entire star, for us to be considered a more advanced civilization. 
And at the same time, the fact that uh, we expect other civilizations to produce a lot of energy and emit so much energy that we can see it from everywhere is also incorrect. An advanced civilization would produce practically no residual heat, it would produce nothing that we can actually observe from anywhere simply because of the fact that they should be completely integrated with their environment and waste no energy, waste nothing. This is the assumption in this particular study and it makes a lot of sense. Which of course means that the complexity of a civilization really should not depend on the amount of available energy or the energy produced or the energy we can detect. The signals, the radio communications, whatever else the civilization is using to communicate would be invisible to us simply because it would be extremely efficient. And all of these civilizations could definitely exist everywhere in the universe, everywhere in our own galaxy and even be completely right next to us and we might not even be seeing them because first of all we don't really know what to look for and second of all they would be indistinguishable from their natural environment and to us they might even look like just regular matter but we would have no idea that it's actually alien life we're looking at and not just any alien life, super intelligent alien life. And if these civilizations become so advanced does it even need to have these advanced structures, mega structures, all of these crazy ideas that we proposed for an advanced civilization to have? Especially if it advances to the point where it can easily manipulate the environment around itself using extremely efficient methods without the need for any mega structures. And if so, well, first of all, it means that the SETI mission that we have, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is definitely going to fail. We're not going to be able to find a more advanced civilization by making the same assumption that we currently see with ourselves that we need to have bigger and better tools. We're not going to be finding any Dyson spheres out there. But secondly, this also provides an excellent solution to the Fermi paradox. The reason we're not seeing anything out there is because that's by design. The implication behind the study is that the complexity does not mean that you're easier to detect. It does not mean you need megastructures, it just means you become almost indistinguishable from the background. And because currently our interaction with the universe is very different from what this advanced civilization would be doing, we don't even know what to look for. It's almost impossible for us to imagine what we should be looking for and what we can possibly discover somewhere out there. Which is of course what the famous Arthur C. Clarke was proposing as well. To quote him directly, any advanced extraterrestrial intelligence will be indistinguishable from nature. Which is an excellent solution to Fermi Paradox and an excellent solution to, well, I guess seeing where we might be headed as well, assuming of course we survive for a few thousand years or so. And so according to this paper, based on our own biases and seeing how we've advanced throughout the last few hundreds of years, we kind of assume that this is what everyone and everything in the universe does as well. But it might be completely wrong because there is no evidence anywhere out there and so far using this assumption Fermi paradox has been unfortunately unresolved. Whereas this qualitative approach does seem to provide some answers to why we're not seeing anything and where we're actually headed. And unfortunately this also means that we're probably not going to be seeing any techno signatures anytime soon. But it also means that at some point we're going to stop separating the natural and the artificial. Everything is going to become one assuming that we progress as the scientists in this paper speculate. But for now I guess we're just going to keep looking and keep studying the nature around us and try to discover how to become better ourselves. Because it does look like this is probably the way that we should be advancing as well. Anyway, on that note check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon and maybe support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out and as always bye bye.
Hello, wonderful person. So let's talk about the Kardashian scale. Wait, what? Kardashian scale? That's a completely different scale. Kardashev. Kardashev scale. 